Welcome to AFI Docs Film Festival presented by at and I'm Michael Lumpkin, the director of AFI Festivals. I want to start by thanking those who make this festival possible. Our presenting sponsor, at and all of our many supporters and donors, AFI members, and you, our audience. Thank you for watching. We're here today with the director and special guest from Frida Got a Gun. Talking with our guest today is Travel Anderson, the award-winning journalist, social curator, and world changer who always comes to slay. So thanks all of you for joining us today. And so Travel, take it away. Thank you, Michael. It's amazing to hear you hear hear you say that I always come to slay. That's amazing. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so excited to have this conversation. Thank you so much, Michael, for having us. I'm going to bring in our panelists. First up, we have uh, Big Frida. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Travel. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. We also have Dr. Ashanta Wyatt joining us. How are yeah. you? I'm great, and you? I'm good. And then last but not least, we have our director of Frida Got a Gun, Chris McKim. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. All right, so let's just jump right into this conversation. I'm gonna start with you, Frida. Um, talk to me about the idea behind um, doing this documentary. How did the idea come to you in the first place? Well, it was brought to me by Chris McKim, the director, and Randy Barbado um, from World of Wonder. And they asked me that I want to do something a little bit more serious than what I normally do, my TV docu-series, which is on Fuse TV. So, and, uh, you know, of course, um, you know, not doing the reality show, I wanted to do something that can also just keep me in the limelight and get a message out there. And, and at the time, we looked at my life and we looked at everything around it and to see what was important that I needed to tell. And... Um, that's how we come up with Frida Got a Gun. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, s subjects that's happening here in New Orleans with the epidemic of gun violence and me losing my brother to gun violence and just so much violence here in New Orleans. And it was something that I wanted to touch on um, for my city mm -hmm. as a whole, but also for the world, you know, and it's perfect timing right now, especially with all that's going on in the world. Um, George Floyd was one of my friends and you know, just his death is we're on our way to a change. And I hope okay. that, you know, we can stand up and continue to fight for what's, what's right right now. Yeah. Chris, talk to me a little bit about, about the idea for, um, I mean, I feel like a lot of people are used to seeing um, Big Frida um, from the series. It's the music. Um, but this documentary, as she said, is, is a lot more serious than some of the other things that we've seen. Talk to us about um, your vantage point into this story. Um, well, you know, I, Frida and I have worked to known, worked together and known each other since 2014. And, you know, it's, it's been, we've had a lot of great adventures and a lot of um, highs and lows along the, along the way. And, you know, when Adam passed away, it, it, it did seem like an opportunity to do something different. Um, so much of our relationship sort of, our relationship was born from storytelling. So much of it has been telling Frida's story in various ways, whether it's the career or her family or the community. And so it just grew really, you know, out of that. And so much of, you know, when, when crime and, and gun violence in cities is in the news, so much of it is about the law and order or the crime or the stats, but it doesn't necessarily go behind the scenes and really see how it impacts individuals, how it impacts the community or how the community is really working together to change that. So this was kind of an opportunity to get in there and, and really make it personal and, and, you know, hopefully show some ways that it can be combated um, outside of the community because the mm -hmm. sources and the reasons why this, you know, these things come about are basically, you know, systemic racism. You know, Charles Blow says in the film that, you know, yes, you can tell these boys that guns aren't the answer, violence isn't the answer, but, you know, they, they don't exist in a bubble. They exist in a world that society created, white society created these problems. Um, and it's up to us to, to try to, to, to fix it. But we also have to help these boys in real time as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, about the community. Um, Dr. Wyatt, you're someone from this community. Um, as an educator, um, you're obviously very involved in the lives of a lot of your students. Um, I'm wondering from your vantage point, what have you witnessed in terms of, of their experiences and your own particular experience as it comes to, to gun violence? 
Um, it, this is very personal to me. Like being a part of this documentary, I, I can't express how grateful I am to Frida and also to Chris for allowing me to even have the space to share the stories of my students and myself as well. Um, I was engaged and my, my fiance was murdered in September of 2015. Um, broad daylight, Sunday morning, cutting the grass and he was shot and killed. Mm. And so I found myself um, not only trying to navigate this space of helping my community, but then I needed help myself grieving and just trying to understand how to bring about things. So this documentary presented that opportunity, but with my children, my kids particularly, um, they look at New Orleans as a place where hope goes to die. And so they don't think about life beyond that moment. They, they, they're living in a bubble of, I have to hurt you before you hurt me in order for me just to exist. And I mean, their vantage point, I just think that it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to think at 13 and 14 years old, all you're thinking about is how to survive instead of how to live. And so um, I think this documentary is going to shed some light on why things happen and just give people insight into what we can do as a community as a whole to, to affect change. Yeah, Frida, uh, as Chris mentioned, and, and Dr. Wyatt, you know, this documentary kind of gives a lot of, uh, of, of attention to the personal stories of how gun violence affects people. I'm wondering if you were hesitant about um, talking as in detail as you do in the film about your own personal experience and things that happened to, to you and your family. Um, I definitely was, um, but also when I signed up, I knew that it was not going to be easy. You know, I knew that I would have to go in depth. I was going to have to relive my brother's killing. I was going to have to just endure that pain. And for me, it's to reach more people and to give hope and the story to more people. So I had to go there and 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 go in depth and go back in and relive those moments and it was really really tough it's still tough for me i haven't even finished watching the film i only got halfway through and i just couldn't take no more at the moment but um and even as i talk about it it, it makes me you know it gets me shaken it gets me a little bit emotional um just even i'm still grieving myself behind my brother you know it was not long ago that he was killed and he was took down by gun violence, you know, black on black crime. And it's just ridiculous to see all the stuff that we have to endure as a community and as a family, you know, in these rough times. And people don't know the pain that you feel once you close your door and the phone stall, the phone calls stop and the flowers stop and people go their separate ways. And you have to deal with that on your own. And for me, the only way that I get through is through God and the strength of praying. Mm -hmm. Chris, could you talk to us a little bit about um, putting the story together and finding some of the other voices, um, including Dr. Wyatt's, that you include in the film? Um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, we, before we came down to begin filming, uh, we, you know, we were doing some online research, but, you know, uh, Atlanta, um, sorry, New Orleans um, is a very communal city, and you really have to be on the ground to kind of make the connections and all of that, and we, we were aware of Ashanti's work before we got down there, and, you know, we met her before we started filming, and she, I mean, you can see in the film how much she shares not just of her own life, but um, of her work and her love with the community and, and really what she's doing to try to make a change. But she also opened a lot of doors for us. Um, and that's kind of how New Orleans is anyway. It's like, it almost feels like everyone knows everyone. And, you know, um, yeah, right. And, <laughs> and Frida is the queen and unofficial mayor of the, the queen. City, so. Yeah, indeed, queen diva. I'm the um, second mayor. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, so when, when, with Frida's trust in us, you know, when we reach out to people, that means a lot, um, you know, and of course we have to live up to that um, and carry that responsibility, um, but it does help. And, you know, that was, that really kind of opened up um, a lot of avenues. It was an opportunity to, to meet a lot of people. And along the way, you know, you meet one person, as I said, Ashanta, Kevin Pep, um, we met early on and then, he was introducing us to other people. Um, you know, some of these things ended up in the film, some didn't, but you know, it was, it was really a communal effort and it was 
it never would have happened without the help of you know everyone down there. Yeah, I remember from the film. I think one of the one of the scenes that's most striking to me is when you all are uh, in the school meeting with the other students, um, and all the kids seem so comfortable talking about gun violence and and how it's impacted them. Um, and it kind of struck me, um, Dr. Wyatt, about how comfortable they were. Um, and Charles Bull says in the in the film talks about um, the experiences that some of our communities have as it relates to um, gun violence, but also these broader societal ills that that cause us to feel like having a gun is how we protect ourselves. Um, from your vantage point, Dr. Wyatt, what are some of the like misconceptions that you think people have about our communities when it comes to these conversations around gun violence? I mean, the first thing that jumps in my mind is that we don't love each other and we don't care about what's happening in our community that right. couldn't be further from the truth because we do it's just that we live in a in a city new orleans where murder is glorified killers are glorified um this this we it's almost like a culture of violence our kids grow up in it their fathers were a part of it and they have to live up to some sort of street legacy in their minds and so just trying to change mindsets i think is the hardest part um and if you know anything about New Orleans, trust is everything. If, if these kids don't trust you, they will not talk to you. They won't allow you close to them. And just, just being able to put that panel together and have Frida come in, it, it spoke to the trust that my kids had in me and the, the trust that I had in Frida because I know her heart was in the right place in terms of wanting better for my, my kids. And I always say my because it's personal. Mm -hmm. These kids, I love them like my own. I only have one son, but I see my son in all of them. But for direction in my son's life, he can be one of those children out here trying to be adults before their time. Mm -hmm. Our kids are living in a space where they're trying to help provide, you know, for households because their mothers are living below the poverty line. And as a boy, you're looked at like the man of the house when there's man in the house. And so a lot of them doing things to just try to help make ends meet, whether it's legal or illegal, they think it's right to do because it's bringing money home to their mothers. And so um, when we talk about misconceptions is, you know, when you see a lot of violence, people think the neighborhood doesn't care, but mm -hmm. the neighborhood cares. You know, we, we just have to find the right resources and have the right access to be able to provide the change that we want to see for our kids. Yeah. And it's, it's also in a lot of ways, the way I see it about survival, yeah. um, they feel as if they have to do these things in order to survive. Uh, Frida, you talk in the documentary <clears throat> about witnessing um, and listening to some of the students' stories um, and how in a lot of ways they mirrored yours when you were younger. How was it to see that not much has changed since you were a kid going through some of the same issues? It was very disturbing. Um, it was actually a lot worse now than it was back then. You know, um, back then you had a few bad apples, but now it's like everybody want to be a gangster in, in the group or you got to have your boys back. So it's way worse now with the new generation than versus it was back then. And it was very heartbreaking just to see it. It, it, it had me in tears. It bothered me a lot of nights at home. And me and Dr. Wyatt kept talking and I kept checking on one particular kid, which was Devin, because it reminded me of my little brother, you know, growing up and wanting to live like his bigger cousin or his uncle or the boys in the neighborhood. So it, it's very disturbing to see that nothing really has changed and we need better outlets and that's up to our community leaders yeah. to make this change happen. I'm, I'm grateful for my mom because she pushed us so hard. And even my brother wanting to turn out to be gangster, she still would be on him. You still going to church. You still have to be inside at nine o'clock. She still will whoop his ass. You know, all of these things will still happen. And she still get, made him follow the guidelines. But somewhere in his mind, he still wanted to be like everybody in the neighborhood. And until you can break yourself and separate yourself from other people and be a leader and not a follower, you, that you won't see change. Mm -hmm. And nothing really has changed. It, it's really gotten worse as I see it because there's so many kids affected by it. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Those kids touched me in that room. 
Chris, you spoke about um, kind of the the community effort that it appears is is going on to like um, protect the community. Um, could you talk about some of the other voices, some of the other people that you all include in the documentary, in addition to Frida and Dr. Wyatt? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, Calvin Pep, who is a, a violence mediator in town um, and works with Ceasefire, which is, I mean, especially now with all this talk about defunding the police and, and, and having to guide people in that argument towards what that might mean when you see efforts like Ceasefire, which, um, you know, they're, they're partially based out of the local trauma center and they really focus on revenge um, killings so that if someone is shot and it ends up in the hospital, the first thing they do is gravitate towards, well, that, if that person is healthy enough to get out, that person's family members that may want to, to do something about it. And they really kind of um, focus on that. The peacekeepers um, and Willie Muhammad, who's also in it, uh, a similar sort of violence mediator thing, they tend to, to work, um, I think, before the step <laughs> that ceasefire gets to, which is, you know, they're kind of in, they step in once there's already things happening in, in some ways. Um, but you know their their efforts are so important, and those were really like two of the big things. And when you see uh, Calvin in the film, you know here's somebody who who has grown up like many of these kids that are out there now, um, who might be you know, uh, you know as the Shanta said and, and and Frida said, you know they 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 may be in trouble, and he's gone through that himself, and he's able to like kind of, well you see it with him and Devin speak to the logic as, as a 14-year-old, a unformed as all 14-year-old children are, um, not thinking things through and really able to use his experience to kind of help um, diffuse a situation or, or you know, break down a logic that they're not even just based on their age and their experience and whatever trauma they've been to aren't prepared to kind of look at the big picture. Um, and that's so important. And, you know, again, like, as, as I was saying, you know, when you talk about sort of de defunding the police, when people talk about this, these are the types of things that could help replace that. It's not about putting in, you know, putting a person in jail after something has happened. It's trying to stop it before it's happened, which is yeah. more important. You mentioned the police and there was there's a slide, um, I believe, at the beginning of the film in which you say that, like, you reached out to the police department and they did not participate. Um, that struck me as interesting. Um, and I'm wondering if you if they gave you any reason as to why they weren't interested in participating. Uh, not really. Initially, it sounded like it might have to do, you know, my, Adam's case was, and, you know, is still open. So that it's kind of framed in a way that was like, you know, we can't talk about this because it's an open investigation. And then follow-ups, it was like, well, there is so much more we can talk about and we don't want to harmony. And, you know, we can stay away from the specifics of that case specifically and talk about a world of issues. Um, but they, they were not going to make anyone available to us, which is mm. more or less the, the exact language. They didn't want to do it. No. <laughs> do you do you uh frida have uh, an idea as to why you think they they weren't interested in being I part mean, of it it's it's just something that don't happen it's if they're not trying to be for the community and it's mm. it's efforts like this like if they may have done this this may have opened up to people being able to want to talk to the police or get them involved but when you're always staying away from situations, how you expect people to trust you and to rely on you? And, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm not really certain why they did it. You know, I wish they would have did it. Um, God, I wish they would have, not, you know, just even any information to help with any case. We didn't have to talk about my brother's case. It could have been anything dealing with gun violence or just somebody to talk about how they deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis coming from the police side of it. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have just, you know, let people see a different side of it and it didn't happen. Yeah. Dr. Wyatt, I'm wondering as an educator, like what are the conversations like 
um, that y'all are having in class, I, I assume this impacts like, you know, kids' education and whether or not they can focus or whether or not they're able to do what they need to do in the classroom. I'm wondering how these conversations of gun violence like manifest themselves in the classroom, in the school, if, if at all. And Dr. White, don't forget gun drills. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, Charles Blow said it best. These, these issues are systemic. Right. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing in our communities is a, di a direct reflection of what we're not doing for our kids inside of schools and inside of our homes. And so what you see is um, a line of people dropping the ball on, on kids. And so what they're not getting at home, we, we try to fill a gap at school and what they're not getting in school, they're going into the communities trying to figure out on their own. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the conversation you know, even before we can start to teach them, I have to build trust with them. I have to show them that I actually care. I'm born and raised in the Fisher Housing Development. I come from the same environments they come from. You know, I, I watch murders happen in my community. I've, my, my family has been involved in murders. They've, they've committed crimes. Crimes have been committed against us. But again, it's just a mindset. And so, like Frida said, when you're at school and you have to work on shooter drills, you know, when you should be working on literacy drills, it's hard to fill gaps educationally when you're actually trying to survive. And the problem with a lot of our kids is the fact that they're already raised on survival instead of love. They're coming into, into the world on survival. And so when you have somebody like Devin, for instance, I, Frida, he, he grew on Frida the same way he grew on me. I find myself still to this day looking after this child. I've gone to court with this child even after the documentary wrapped just over, because I wanted him to understand that my love and my care wasn't just in that moment. I want to see you do better. I want you to make better choices. And so the documentary was, was a blessing in such a way that he opened up in ways that I couldn't even imagine him doing without the documentary mm. because I think that was his cry for help. That was his way of saying, I'm living like this, but I don't really want to live like this. Help me. Yeah. You know, and, and he opened up in such a way that I believe it was a cry for help, a cry to want something different. But again, he can want something different. But if we're not collectively changing the minds of all of these children, the people that he's having these issues with aren't going to let him have something different. Mm -hmm. And that, that becomes the problem. You know, Devin can want to change, but then if his adversary doesn't want to change, that's going to pull him back into the, the drama that he's trying to escape. And yeah, so it's cyclical, in that, it's cyclical in that way. And I'm again, I'm just grateful. I think this is an opportunity not only to highlight what's happening in New Orleans, but to highlight what's happening in New Orleans on a larger scale, because this isn't just exclusive to New Orleans. Gun violence is affecting Black communities across the country, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not just police brutality. It's, it's inner city violence because you're putting everybody who has zero hope in the same community and, and expecting them to mm -hmm. figure it out. And the only way for them to figure it out is to do what they only know how to do. And that is to survive. And if that means hurting you to survive, that's what they're going to do. And people are going to protect themselves. Absolutely. People are going to protect themselves in, 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 in every way that's possible. Absolutely. You know, and it affected me when I was shot and mm -hmm. I had to, the only way that I wanted to come outside is until I got a gun and mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't feel safe without having a gun. So it's, it's something about your community. It's something about things that needs to change. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of this stuff starts at home. Exactly. It, it truly starts at home. Exactly. If your surroundings don't change, you know, like I was so gr grateful for when my mom and dad moved us off of Josephine Street. Mm -hmm. They moved us into a better community, you know, and as time went on, we kept moving into different communities to, you know, stay out of, out of, out of harm's way. Mm -hmm. So you, you got to keep on moving and you got to keep on doing different things to kind of make change in your life. Yeah, as we wrap up, um, I want to ask this question of all of you. As more audiences, more people see the film and they get to know a little bit about your individual stories and the story of New Orleans, um, what do you want them to, to take away from seeing this story? We'll start with Dr. Wyatt. Um, I, I want them to take away the importance of the village because I, when I grew up, whatever my mom and my family could not provide, 
our neighbors looked after us. You could chastise children when I was coming up and you didn't have to worry about fighting with the family or, you know, having conflict with, you know, it was a community effort. And mm -hmm. I think we have to give back to caring about each other on a level that is beyond just our households and just our families. And I, I think we have to get back to a point where when I see you, I see myself. And then I don't want to hurt you because to hurt you is to hurt me. So I think if you take anything away from the film, it's the fact that New Orleans has people that care and love New Orleans. And we care and love the children in New Orleans. And we want to have change happen. But we have to bring that back to the neighborhood, the village. And, and, and it's about an us thing instead of an I thing. And I think that's what I want people to understand. We can't, we can't change the world if we only care about self. Thank you for that. Chris, what about for you? What do you hope audiences take away from the film? Well, you know, one of the things we didn't get to talk about is, is mental health and the amount of trauma that people are going through, whether it's through the gun violence, whether it's things like Katrina, whether it's COVID um, and, and how that's affecting the Black community and also why it's affecting the Black community in the way it is, mm -hmm. which, I mean, you could replace gun violence with health issues and the causes are the same. And I think, you know, I, I think understanding, no one on this, everyone on this panel understands that. For white audiences to understand that you can just spin the wheel of problems and they all have the same causes and it's trying to find different ways um, to fix these things, you know, both in being aware, but also how can we dismantle each one of these little problems? Um, how can we help kids now while also kind of bringing down um, the systemic problems that, that really cause it and have caused it for a long, long time? Definitely. Frida, your story is at the center of, of this. Um, what do you hope audiences take away from seeing it? There are so many things that I hope that each piece of this docu-series can help someone take something away from it all the way through from the beginning to the end, no matter what part that it touch in their lives. But also, I want younger people to think really hard before carrying a gun and how that in an instant that it can change your life forever. And some things cannot be rewind. You know, some things cannot be taken back. And, and also before they think about taking someone's life, you know, you have to think before you act on every situation because the repercussions are very serious. And last but not least, right now it, it's the topic all across the country, Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And when are we going to stop Black on Black violence? I want them to take away that it is time for all of us to start spreading love in our community. It starts at home, like Dr. Wyatt says. And I'm glad that I was blessed to grow up in the era that I did where she said, if the neighbor saw you do it, you got to whip it from the neighbor, Thank then you your mom. mama, then your daddy. <laughs> That's how we was raised. Yes. And you couldn't get away with doing anything without somebody knowing your mama that saw you. I couldn't get away with nothing. My mama would say, oh, yeah, you was over there, huh? <laughs> so I just wish that they can relate to something out of this whole film and they can take away from it and they could think really hard before they act. Mm -hmm. And because it can change your life forever. And Absolutely. like I said, some things can be re erased, some things cannot be rewind. And I want them to think before they act before anything. Definitely. Thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Yeah. This is awesome. Bye, Chris. Bye, Dr. Wyatt. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. Congratulations, Dr. Wyatt. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank this you for that. This so awesome. It was. I still want those glasses, Travel. <laughs> <laughs> they go so well with the background. Do you have different Thank glasses you. for different backgrounds? Of course oh, yeah. I do. <laughs> Thank I you, Free. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank Chris. you so much. This was amazing.